Hey, Redcon Raider here, and welcome back to the Alpha for Warhammer 40k, Rogue Trader. As today, we try to get to the bottom of what's so foul about this stone. Though, I mean, honestly, given, uh, given what we've encountered during our travels thus far, the mind kind of boggles at the possibilities there. Let's just hope it's nothing too bad. Also, uh, Foul Stone sounds like a really bad place to get ice cream. But that's neither here nor there. Let's check it out. Ten scans complete. Might have to find our way back to Footfall at some point soon. But, for now... Lord Captain, we have received a transmission from Foulstone. It was sent by members of the Order of the Hammer, votaries of St. Cognatius, whose monastery is the only settlement on the planet. Or rather, it used to be. Some time ago, a transport vessel, the Navica, unloaded several thousand refugees from a planet belonging to Rogue Trader Winterscale. The Order of the Hammer has judged this invasion to be an act of aggression, and is asking for your lordship's protection. Hmm. Those people are victims, not invaders. Prepare my shuttle. I shall head to the planet and resolve this conflict. As it pleases, your lordship. Damn straight. Oh, uh, it's okay, so it's a book event. With an illustration I could swear is right out of the rule books. That looks really familiar. Sector Coronis Expanse. Region Askasar System. Location Monastery of St. Cognatius, Foulstone. Material Chronicle compiled by the humble archivist, Brother Petricos. Six score and eleven days after the feast of the passing of Nicomedus Keith, the champion of the faith. Disquietude marred the calm of the Monastery of the Order of the Hammer. Countless tortured souls steeped in fear arrived on Foulstone in a star bark. A great apostasy had befallen their home and turned them into abject wanderers seeking help and refuge. Their wicked and cruel captain, the owner of the Navica, had betrayed them. Once the unknowing souls in his care had made landfall on the world's surface, he most deviously recalled his shuttles and left thus ridding himself of his duty to care for the unfortunate lot. Not knowing how they would survive in Foulstone's grim wastelands, the forsaken people came to the monastery of St. Cognatius, and there they surrounded its walls. They hammered their fists on its gates and implored and wailed, Take us in! Protect us! And what once was a place of serenity and grace was now full of din, disorder, and all manner of things despicable. The interlopers brought with them worldly futility and strife, and mayhaps also the seeds of alluring blasphemies if fiendly heathens lurked in their midst. After a prayer, the prelate Hectarchius. turned his eye to the past in search of instruction. Raylan Hectarchius recalled the first missionaries to set foot on Foulstone's vast wasteland, led by their zeal for serving St. Cognatius. And those missionaries had received the blessing of Nicomedes Keith, the champion of faith who had traveled with them in their star bark, to found in this place a humble and pure abode wherein to cultivate wisdom and piety. How bravely the brethren and sisters of the Order of the Hammer set out for other planets, when summoned hereto by their faith, and how steadfastly they kept worldly things beyond the walls of their secluded abode. For thus their covenant commanded. Well, that's not encouraging, because that would imply that in their zeal to emulate Nicomedes Keith, they would steadfastly refuse to allow the refugees into their into their outpost, let alone aid them. He appealed to the wisdom of St. Cognatius. 
While deep in prayer, there came to him a revelation that St. Cognatius, a man of great endeavors, a warrior and a wise artificer, never cowered behind the walls of a librarian, but stepped bravely into the darkness, carrying light in the palm of his hand, and he commanded others to do the same. And not only Foulstone, but many other worlds of the Coronis Expanse bear its imprint. After a prayer, the prelate Hectarchius. Well, as much as I'd like to imagine, he warmly welcomed the refugees. Given the zeal and the, uh, and the focus on Cognatius being a warrior, I imagine things get bloody. Sorry, refugees. I'll try to defuse this as quickly as possible. I will say, though, it, it's very weird they're letting us dictate what other characters do, like NPCs, as opposed to our own... our own main and his companions. That's, um... that's weird. Prelate Hectarchius ordered that lethal force be used against the interlopers. The brethren and the sisters of the Order of the Hammer donned their flat cowls, inscribed words of praise to the God Emperor on their tactical visors, and went forth to render service in battle. With las guns and bolters, they pierced the interlopers. With their chain swords and power flails, they struck them, and a great and bloody harvest was reaped that day. But the interlopers, too, scant though their armament was, and scanter their skill in battle, slew many among the monastery's dwellers, for great were their numbers, and greater their desperation. A quarrel broke out. The hungry and the sick lay siege to the monastery, begging for help. In their spite, they blocked the water collector and unpowered the generatorium. The faithful, in the meantime, made ready to resist. And a miracle came to pass. The god emperor sent his champion his confidant, his right hand, the rogue traitor of the blessed House von Valencius. May the light of his grace remain upon it forever. The blessed rogue traitor. Well, this one looks like we just claimed the whole planet. That sounds appealing. But we should probably also try to resolve the dispute. The strangers, prodigious in number, beseech the rogue trader to take them in and give them shelter and protection as to his own servants. And spake they, saying, Long have we wandered, swiftly have we fled, many a woe and ordeal has befallen us. Of many a father and son are we bereft. Now the warp hath taken the last of our strength, and we shall flee no more. And they spake further, saying, Without thy holy protection we are doomed, for we fear annihilation at the hands of our kin who remained behind. For, having fallen away from the sublime light of the Emperor, they have descended into bloody sedition, and become murtherers of no mercy. Quoth Prelate Hectarchius, Ours is a pure and secluded abode. By worldly futility we are untouched, and so we wish to remain. These unknowing souls seek to capture our abode. Avert this calamity of ours, for they are a people malicious and multitudinous and misfated. Then quoth he, If it be thy wish to confer land upon these wretches, confer it, for Foulstone has arid land in abundance. But make it not our duty to care for them, for that is not our path. Oh, well, I mean, if there's ample arid land and you are willing to turn a blind eye to the recent slaughters, then sure, absolutely. I will claim the entire planet and allow the refugees to settle here. The mighty rogue trader extended a veil of protection over the interlopers, taking them into his care, and thereby all of Foulstone with them. For truly, he is a generous lord. Also, free planet. Oh, wow. <laughs> Look at that. 
that actually did give us our first colony. Humbly, the Order of the Hammer heeded the God Emperor's confidant, and unsealed the airlocks and opened the gate of its abode, and brought forth gifts of virtue to relieve the suffering of the ill-stricken. After a prayer, the architect set to work, in accordance with the saints' teachings and the parameters set forth in the standard template construct. They erected spacious living quarters and sturdy fort walls for the planetary militia, and a spacious auditorium wherein to trade and store goods, and a proud sensorum within whose walls clerks and servo bondsmen would maintain order and keep statistical records. And a new, righteous way of life came to Foulstone, and the people rejoiced, and all was good. Oh, and we have a colony tab now. Not entirely sure what I'm looking at, but I see some colony stats here. Efficiency, contentment, security. Seems relatively straightforward there, but I mean, I'm not, not seeing any way we can actually influence it just yet. Nothing on the project list. I'll do some off-screen research into how all this works. Keep in mind, this is just the alpha. It's possible a lot of this stuff just isn't implemented yet. But if there is stuff we can do with colonies, then we'll, we'll certainly putter with it in a future episode. That said, for now, we are pretty much done with Trinidos. Sector cleared, our first colony established. Let's move on to the next sector, see what other adventures await. There we are. Scan complete. We now have connections to Omicron System Speculo and the Cradle of Kefri. But, as usual, we'll air towards the safest routes, and we'll start with Omicron. Lord Captain, I hasted to report the disturbing news brought to me by the machine spirits of the ship. The matter is extremely delicate and concerns Lady Cassia. You see, since her first days aboard, her presence has been a disturbance to the crew's way of life. If you'll allow, I have prepared a detailed report. Very well, Boxmaster. Deliver your report. The first incident occurred immediately after our departure from Urak 5. The Lady Navigator chastised one of the ship's runners, after which he went to his living quarters, killed his family, and then shot himself. The second incident was noted while traversing the warp. The Lady Navigator gave the pilots the wrong instructions, and the void ship was thrown off course. For a matter of minutes, but this was enough for the forces of the Immaterium to anger the machine spirits enough for them to start a fire in the service bay. Uh, I feel like one of those incidents is slightly more concerning than the other, but I'm not sure we'd see eye to eye on which is which. Continue. After that, officers living near the Lady Navigator's quarters began to express extreme emotions. Hysteria, apathy, euphoria, rage. This is quite detrimental to crew morale and performance. The last incident was recorded on Footfall. Around a hundred live birds were delivered on board during our stay on Footfall. Each bird cost a hefty sum. But I have failed to discover their purpose and subsequent fate. Well, that sounds like a canary in a coal mine kind of situation. Maybe people testing to see whether it's safe to approach her. But it would have to be someone pretty high in the chain to actually afford it. I was also told about a conflict between the Lady Navigator and the Seneschal. Alas, with no details. If you like, you can ask Master Worsurian directly. Things are even worse with Jay Hadari. I intercepted a Voxcast in which he promised she would, and I quote, end that Kasha if she ever saw her again. If I may, Lord Captain, the Lady Navigator's state of mind worries me. 
She is self-contained and does not mesh with her crew at all, which is why everyone avoids her. Even senior officers can be superstitious. I fear that only you are in a position to talk to her on an equal footing and improve the situation. For the sake of the crew's safety, and that of Lady Cassia herself. Stranger among her own. Yeah, we should probably look into that. No immediate threats in sight, so let's go chat up the crew. Oh, hey, we also pulled yet another level up. Cool. We will worry about that next time. And uh, obviously, this is just the alpha. We're not we're not looking at exhausting all of the crew dialogue or or exploring every facet of the lore. But uh, I do feel like we should at least touch on the companion quests, even if we can't fully resolve it in the current build. Abelard surveys you briskly but meticulously, as though he is inspecting you for shortcomings. Then he offers a courteous nod. Lord Captain. I hear you and Lady Cassia exchanged words recently. What happened? And who brought this piece of news to you, I wonder? Abelard lets out a scornful snort. Then again, I have nothing to hide from you. Of late, the pilots have been going off course with increasing frequency, and the reports are full of contradicting accounts. The problem continued even after several demotions were handed out, so I took it upon myself to investigate. I was astonished to learn that our Lady Navigator has been amending entries in the ship's log, and the officers have been keeping silent on her orders. I immediately demanded an end to this outrageous conduct, and I reprimanded Lady Cassia in front of the officers. She greeted my words with silence, and then quickly departed. Abelard heaves a sigh. I should not have acted thus. I never even found out what drove her to do it. I say... Thank you, Abelard. I'll look into this. Lord Captain, Abelard gives you a regulation salute. All right, now where is Heydari hiding? Cassie's up front. She's right up near the control consoles. Ah, okay. That makes sense. Hidari's positioned about as far as humanly possible from Cassia. Which I guess would make sense if the two have been spatting. Jay smiles broadly, showing her pearly teeth. Allow me to thank you again for helping me with the cargo, Shireen. I am sure the Ashmags who squirreled away my goods won't give up so easily, and I'll hear more about their scheming yet. Let's strike a deal, Shireen. I will watch your back if you do me a favor and watch mine. The woman laughs melodically. <laughs> well, enough jokes. Is there something you wanted? Yes, I heard you've had some sort of falling out with Cassia. I hear your mutterings about her have grown quite dark as of late. So, Vigdis is snooping in on my box line. Jay grins crookedly and shrugs. I wasn't threatening your navigator. Didn't even think about it. I was just relaxing in the good company of fragrant Amasek, sweet-scented Low, and a handful of new friends from the upper decks. And right in the middle of the fun, the Lady Navigator swoops in and starts jabbering about how her head is about to split from the cacophony of colors coming from our cabin. Nice alliteration. Long story short, Shireen, I had the misfortune of getting a taste of what your officers have been going on about. They say when the Orcelio girl becomes upset, everyone in the vicinity loses their minds and is overtaken by Ozzy. And it hurt like anything, 
I can only remember everyone huddling in a corner, wailing like klaxons. As for Cassia, I think Cassia was flustered by the state of our clothes, which were very meager back then, as you understand. Before I could get my bearings, the poor thing was gone. The whole situation was awkward. As for the threats, they were addressed to one of the girls I'd been foolish enough to invite to our little party. That Kasha used the confusion to pilfer a full pouch of low from under my nose. Sure, sure, fair enough. Um, I can't help but notice that you and Argenta seem to have a thing going on, too. Is there anything I should know there? Argenta... The smuggler blushes. What could be more beautiful than the sight of a sister of battle, whose mere presence casts light in the dark corners of lost souls such as mine? But alas, what remains of my sanity is telling me that poor Jay can only admire the radiance of this angel, forsaking any hope of ever touching her wings. Yes, yes, uh, for better or worse, Argenta is not a romanceable character. All right, Jay, I'll leave you to it. See you around. Oh, I have no doubt you will. Jay laughs and bids you farewell with a wink. Right, and uh, as you may have no doubt gathered, Jay is a romance option. As is uh, Cassia. And Abelard. Not sure about the others, though. I could maybe see Adira, possibly even Heinrich. Probably not Pascal. Alright, let's have words with our... Vox Master. A thin, pale woman stands head and shoulders above the rest of the crew. There is a thick bundle of cables coming out of the back of her skull and disappearing under her ceremonial garment and you see the grate of a quietly humming vox where her mouth should be. The woman sees you and bows her head in a respectful greeting. How may I serve you, Lord Captain? Connect me to the vessel's main channel. I wish to bolster the morale of the crew. The vox master nods obediently and presses several switches on the device she is holding. It is done, Lord Captain. You address the crew with a rousing speech, and hear your voice roll through the ship, reaching even the normally quiet corners of the vessel. When the broadcast ends, you hear distant shouts of approval. Neat. I have no idea what that did. But, um, no, I'm still not seeing a rumor option. Uh, tell me, Vox Master, what exactly are your duties aboard the ship? I am the ears and the voice of this void ship. I supervise several dozen officers and three times that number of support personnel. We receive, send, encrypt, and decode all incoming and outgoing messages through the ship's internal and external channels. And we also ensure clean communications and the optimal efficiency of the crew's Voxcasters. And there we go. Rumors unlocked. If you ever want to know what worries and concerns your crew are harboring, what your subjects are whispering about in local networks after their shifts, and what their leaders are clamoring about over shortwave box transmissions, just come and see me. I will satisfy your curiosity. What have you heard of late? There is unrest on the lower decks, Lord Captain. The guards are actively looking for rabble-rousers and heretics, but the population is extremely unhappy with the harsh treatment. Many are cursing Abelard, whose signature marks the orders, and whose name the oppression is being committed. You may be interested to know that a group of officers was discussing a grim rumor over lunch. Word has it the apparition of Lord Captain Theodora has been sighted on board lately. Yes, you heard right. They say she is haunting the decks, dragging wayward crew members off into oblivion. Disquiet has spread throughout the ship, 
as the anomaly has been reported in different sections, sometimes entire kilometers apart. The Voxmaster leans closer to you. Master Heinrichs von Kalox expressed interest in our communication stations and box networks a short while ago. The interrogator appears to be very well versed in the matters of sacred technology. And it worries me. A man of his knowledge and in his line of work is capable of discreetly planting his own devices in our systems. We will be vigilant, Lord Captain, but you should try to be more careful as well. Thank you, Voxmaster. That will be all. Happy to be of service, Lord Captain. Interesting. So general unrest, a possible haunting, and Heinrichs just being Heinrichs. I did notice that none of the rumors we just picked up from the Voxmaster actually updated our journal. So that might just be stuff that's largely incidental background fluff. I thought it might actually appear in one of our various tabs here. Wait, what are these? This is new. Oh, these are like trade deals. Okay, I'm going to have to take a closer look at that off screen as well. Again, not really sure that's something that's functional in the current build, but um, it definitely bears further investigation. We'll just stay on task for now. We'll chat up Cassie, then use whatever time we have left over to uh, poke around the new sector. Greetings, rogue trader. Cassia raises her chin and smiles politely. I am always glad of an opportunity to talk to you. I wish I were here under better tidings, Cassia. I've heard rumors that you're not getting on with the crew. Not here. I'm begging you, Cassia says in almost a whisper. Aren't noblemen supposed to discuss such things away from the servants? Very well. Let us retire to my study. No one will disturb us there. Then lead the way, and I will answer all of your questions. What is it you want to talk about, Lord Captain? I have nothing to say to your unfounded accusations about my conflicts with the crew. I cannot recall my having a single quarrel with any of your people during my entire time aboard. I've heard dire rumors of a messenger who came into conflict with you and then came to a very unfortunate end along with his entire family. I haven't rebuked a single errand boy on this ship. Cassia ponders this for a moment. Ah, I think I remember. A kind young man with a shy smile and skillful fingers, with too much rotten ochre on his shoulders. I grew tired of the disgusting color and advised him to lighten his burden by casting the weight off his shoulders. He did not come the next day. Or ever again. Ah, I say. And, um, what of, uh, Miss Heydari? I, I heard you came into quite a conflict with her, one which left her muttering dire threats. Cassia's ruby eyes become round, and an unbidden flush suffuses her pale face with a rosy tint. We didn't... I didn't... That is our private business. The issue was between me and Lady J. Lord Captain, please pay it no heed. We made our peace long ago. And I will have you know, no one threatened me. Your information is incorrect. Fair enough. Uh, I mean, both she and Jay insist that 
Jay didn't threaten her, so... I'll, we'll chalk that up to a miscommunication, I guess. What of the rumors that you've been leading the ship off course during mid-warp? The latest incident caused a fire in the service bay. I saw something in the warp. Something vast, predatory, shimmering with indescribable colors. It came from nowhere and stared at the ship with hundreds of hungry eyes, right there in our path. I decided to change the course while it was still possible, but did not want to sow panic. Would it have been better to tell the crew we were headed straight into the monster's gaping maw? Uh, no, no, I guess not, but it's something that probably should have been brought up at some point, because that sounds pretty notable. But wait. If you had a reason to do that, why am I also hearing that you've been deliberately altering the logbooks for the ship's various previous warps? I hear that Abelard confronted you about it. I beg to differ. I read numerous books on Astronataris, and I can swear on House Orcelio's honor that your officers are entering data in complete contravention of regulation. False terms, random distances between lines, spelling mistakes, and even the simplest of words. I have spent the last few cycles correcting the latest log entries, and I thought it would please Master Abelard, as he is so fond of order. And yet, the Seneschal did not appreciate my efforts, and for some reason called them an outrage, even though mere days before he had been swaddling me in warm, yellow words. I noticed all your people do this when they are expressing sympathy. I merely wanted to repay this Seneschal with the same courtesy. Perhaps he finds my friendliness off-putting? You know, he's not the only one who's expressed concerns. There are numerous other officers who are reluctant to be quartered near you, because of the constant emotional outbursts. There have been significant injuries. I already told you I cannot control my abilities. What more do you want from me? Will I be assigned to pariah chaperone? Or will you put me in suppressing shackles? Calm yourself. I'm simply gathering information. But tell me this, Cassia. What became of the 100 birds that were brought on board back on Footfall? No one else seems to know what became of them. Admittedly, I, I am at a loss myself. The day we arrived on Footfall, I, I sent a request to the ship's quartermaster and asked him to get me a songbird. But he never asked for clarification. And shortly before we left, I had a countless number of cages delivered to me, all wrapped in bright red panic with flickering tints of fear. There was a bird in every one. I was so happy, I, I thought I would have a hundred friends instead of just one. They were squeaking so piteously, I let the poor things out. I even fed them my breakfast and dinner. But the stupid birds would not stop chittering even after bedtime. They were dashing about the room, smacking me in the face with their wings, and defecating. I became angry and suddenly they started pecking at each other's eyes and attacking me. Then I became afraid, and they fell over dead. I do not think I want to keep pets anymore. Thank you, Cassia. I believe I've heard enough. Will you share your thoughts with me? This is fascinating. You know who she reminds me of is uh, Mantis from the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. In both cases, they were very, very well-educated and privileged individuals with empathic powers, but who are completely sheltered and thus have no real grasp of social interactions. They have a general gist of how it's supposed to work, but, but they are clunky with it and they have no idea what to do once things start going wrong. Cassie is obviously very dangerous, but it's not intentional. 
In every single case, she explained how she thought she was doing something good. It just got out of hand, and she had no idea how to sort of correct it as it started spiraling. I think you're a good person, Cassia. You simply need some lessons in how to better interact with the people around you. I could assist you with this, if you wish. That would be wonderful. My education on Yurok 5 was cut short, but I had realized by then that the wisdom of books is a poor substitute for the wisdom of experience. Very well. Since we are done with this misunderstanding, I would like to change the subject. It would only be fair for me to ask you a few questions now, wouldn't it? Cassia hesitates and continues in a less confident tone. Do not mistake me. I am not going to accuse you of anything. It's just that... You are the most worthy interlocutor on the entire ship. And you are always so busy. Of course, Lady Cassia. What would you ask of me? I read a treaty by Pacis de Mobius very recently, who claimed that subjects would never believe their new ruler was better than the old one, unless the old one had been a tyrant. No matter the circumstances, the low-born rabble become deluded about their prospects and rebel in favor of their base desires. What do you make of that? Well, I think we're moving into very dicey political territory, and I don't like that, but, um... On the contrary, the loyalty of subjects can be bought at a pittance. Lower a tax, throw them a festival, or feed the needy. A gracious gesture once every cycle will exalt you in the eyes of the rabble, as if it were his own blessing. Obviously an oversimplification, but a lot of people do have short memories. Cassia thinks for a moment and then smiles. Indeed, I was not wrong about your merits, or your ability to hold a conversation. I hope my second question does not confound you either. According to the twenty tomes penned by the preacher Oystak Istefan the Forgotten, mercy and cruelty go through the world hand in hand, but people flock only to one pan of the scales. Would you rather inspire fear in your followers, or be magnanimous and choose awe? I like the persuasion option. I like the fellowship too. I would exercise restraint and lenience in my actions. Excessive suspicion and mistrust harden the hearts of the people and turn them against each other. You may be right. It seems that Cassia did not appreciate your words. Well, shoot. That was a pretty easy check, too. We may not think alike, and I do not always understand your motives. And yet, may I be candid with you? I must confess that sometimes I can hardly bear the burden the house has placed upon me. I feel I am not doing my best. Tell me how you, heir to a trade empire, can bear the responsibility for billions of lives day after day, and not stoop under all the weight... That is a tough question. <laughs> I mean, me personally, I would never be able to do that. I would be just perpetually locked up with choice paralysis. It is my duty, whether I like it or not. I simply have no choice. I do what I can because I must. Thank you for your patience, rogue trader. 
you are helping me to see the world in different colors. A novel experience for me. Our conversations hold a special place in my heart. Allow me to bid you farewell for now. I am heading back to my chambers to consider today's conversation. Interesting. I wonder if that was all part of her romance quest. It did it did have the feel of it, but then again, based on some of the responses we could have chosen, that might also just be to determine the future growth of Cassia's character. What sort of person she'll turn into, or uh, or how her powers develop as you try to guide or control them, or even possibly just outright suppress them. All right, we've uh, we've got a couple of minutes left. Let's go do some quick exploration. I don't think there were any threats in this sector, so we can poke at a planet or two. Space dust. More plasma batteries, I assume. Oh, uh, apparently we can't interact with it. Okay, I guess we'll just move on. Dead world. The ruins of an ancient imperial city were discovered on a dead world completely deprived of an ecosystem. According to the reports, the entire settlement is contained in a titanic glass dome that once held an artificial atmosphere. Your augurs detected the framework for three other similar structures that were never completed. The dome systems failed for whatever reason, so now you are looking at a ghost city that never managed to become a proper colony of the Imperium. I'm going to say it's because you made the dome out of glass. The temple district was situated at the heart of the city. The god emperor statue, intricately carved from precious crystal, is hovering under the dome, supported by chains of gold, and can be seen from anywhere inside the colony. Inspired by the majestic sight, the expedition members set to explore with renewed fervor, and told many tales about the emperor watching them from above after they returned. Your people overran the city like a tidal wave, filled building after building, bunkhouse after bunkhouse, and retreated from the quiet streets just as quickly. There were plenty of useful things among their findings, including foodstuffs and weapons. Blessed bolter casing. Huh. It takes several trips to deliver the massive Promethium storage tanks to your vessel. The crew grimly points out that the colony was running out of fuel. Had the life support systems not failed prematurely, the locals would still perish due to lack of energy. Assorted cargo. Ah, I see. The item readout is basically one screen delayed. A lavishly decorated estate of the local ruler is towering over rows of featureless bunkhouses. Several explorers perished from the cleverly hidden tripwires in the courtyard, but after losing their companions, the team easily disarmed the remaining traps in the estate. Anything of value has been promptly delivered to the rogue trader's vessel, and Lord Captain was given a fancy sword found in the secret cache that once belonged to the mansion's owner. Neat. Let's see how much of this stuff we can actually use. Blessed Bolter Casing. Plus one MP. And grants a plus five bonus on initiative rolls. Okay. 
that's not bad at all. Especially since I believe that is the first next slot item we've found. So there's no conflict. Ghost Sword looks pretty straightforward. Essentially equivalent to a chain sword, I think. Okay, so better than a normal chain sword, but slightly worse than an elite chain sword. And then significantly worse than a force sword. Which I guess makes sense. Though I do now notice that the force sword lacks the melee malice that chain swords and normal swords inflict. Not a big deal, just an interesting trade off. And we are at time, but you know what? What the heck? Let's finish up the sector. Unless, of course, we find an actual landable location. Then we'll save it for next time. Savannah World. Nothing. Fair enough. And Mind World. What is mind? No matter. What is matter? Never mind. Plasteel. We'll take that. That brings us up to 10, but we still have to figure out how to work that order system. I'll have to poke around a bit off screen, see if I can find an interface somewhere. All right, folks. Aside from that errant cloud of space dust over there, Omicron is clear. Which I think brings us to a good stopping point. We'll hit the pause button for now. I'll take stock of our level up options, see if I can figure out the trading and or colony systems. And we will pick up here next time. Granted, not the most action-packed episode today, but uh, I still found it pretty fascinating. I like Cassia, and uh, it was interesting exploring her character a bit like that. Not to mention, of course, we established our first colony, even if we have no idea how that stuff works yet. So yeah, yeah, we'll hit the pause button, pick up here next time. As we either head back to Opticon on Footfall, or we just keep exploring. See you then. Special thanks to the Raiders, the fine folks who helped make these videos possible, including, but not limited to, Dragon Matrix 7, Matthew Smith, Revenant, Aloise, Dracoth, Egg, Eerie V23, Egon Alter, Emil, Excelsior, Goatlieb, James Tremay, Kazorm, Nathan Welch Jr., Overlord Farum, Random Passerby, Robbie B., Thomas Piatkowski, Trip Hop and Skip, and Valenrook. Thanks for your support, guys. That said, if you'd also like to support the channel, you can do so by pushing the buttons that do the things. Trust me, it does make a difference. Or by checking out the Patreon, the YouTube memberships, or the Nexus GG page. Links are in the description.